Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag, where I open my mail. Now, I tried an experiment last time because quite a lot of people asked for it where I actually went through a whole bunch of packages in really short order and uh, averaged about two minutes or didn't do more than two minutes per package. And the feedback from that was, yeah, no one really liked it. They wanted to see more. They did like the speed up process of opening the boxes and things like that. But apart from that, no, they wanted longer technical look at things that were more interesting so yeah we'll kind of have a combination of that maybe anyway let's go um hi to adam trizzle jack uh, that's it. I don't know how to pronounce that one from Gilchin in Germany hi to all my German viewers so let's have a look what adam has sent in shall we and hate ones that have a lot of tape on them. They're actually really quite difficult to open. We have a blank piece of grid paper. Got some awesome postcards. Look at that. Where's that in Germany? Uh, Newman, Mitt Newman, I can't pronounce it. Anyway, there you go. Very, very nice. Oh, and we've got the German Space Operations Center. Maybe he's from the German Space Operations Center. Oh, let's have a look. Any static bag must be good. Sorry, static ship. Oh, no. No, it's simply. Sorry, thank you very much, but it's uh, nothing technical. You can smell them already. Why can you smell them? I have no idea what they are. And nip on. What on earth? Are they? They're like a co chocolate-coated wafery biscuit. Um, thing is, why can you smell through? Like they're supposed to be like you know hermetically sealed packages. Uh, I'm sending you some nice quality, high quality Nippon ChocoCon capacitors. What? I found, what? He found it in an undisclosed German supermarket. They made by a German company called Hoster which is said to be top secret R&D division of Nippon Chemicon Corp. <laughs> what? Each one stores about 280 kilojoules of energy and is rated for up to 1 MV, mouthful volt. However, their ESR sweetener equivalent sweetness rating is relatively high, so they're only suitable as backup caps for low power demand applications. Ah, oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Adam, Nippon, Nippon Chemicon, my favorite capacitors. Next up, we've got one from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hi to all my uh, viewers in Cambridge. This one's from Abdul Rahman Fosen and um, Eric Johnson. Hi, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, from the United States of America. We've got one of these easy pull tabs. Oh, what do we got? We got tubes. Good old fashioned tubes. Electron tubes. For those playing along at home, or tubes, if you want to call them that. A lot of people call them tubes here in Australia. Greetings from MIT. This is Abdul and Eric and their electrical and computer engineering students. I uh, generally enjoy your channel. Thank you very much. Um, would take a, uh, many sleepless nights to so take a break from homework and watch an episode or two. Excellent. We've collected a variety of old vacuum tubes. Seem to be in great shape. They'll found an old store there and probably have been forgotten for decades. No idea how valuable they are today. Some are really valuable. There are some valves, um, mainly for the audio full market, um, that go for like hundreds or even like like eight hundred or a thousand dollars. I think there's some really seriously expensive. Uh, valves if you can still get them. Um, I don't think anyone actually collects them as such I don't think they're worth anything as far as collecting goes, but uh, as far as like, you know tubes for um, uh, For you know audio uh, Stuff then yeah, I think you can get decent money for these things. Anyway, I'm not really a tube guy So we'll take a look at these and if anyone knows if these are any good or not let us know in the comments well, this is almost a who's who of uh, tube manufacturers. We've got uh, National, GE, Sylvania. Um, well, there's some RCA or RCA ripoffs, Raytheon. So yell at the YouTubes if you've heard of any of these. The 5751 from National, made in the United States of America. 
No worries. And we've got a GE uh, 6AQ 5A or a 6HG5 electronic tube. Thank you very much. Or tube. And then General Electric, five stars. Thank you, none of this four-star rubbish made in the United States of America. Yet again, fantastic, the 5749. Uh, what have we got? The 6350 from Sylvania. From Sylvania. Look at that, gold brand electronic tube. Thank you very much. Oh, always love the nipple. And this RCA jobby here, it's a 6AK6 uh, made in USA from RCA. JRC, I thought, oh, maybe that's Japan Radio Corp. Um, but no, it's actually made by RCA. And <laughs> date packaged, 10th month, 54. Wow, fantastic. This electron tube is physically and electrically similar to the CV1762 valve. So uh, RCA making, like, not rip-off valves, but, like, compatible valves, were they? I don't know. Anyone got the history? Raytheon, they're all made in the United States of America. Um, radio tubes, there we go. It's a 6BC7. I'm sure there's some 6BC7 fanboys out there. And this monster here, which is a rather um, ugly looking tube. Check that out. I don't, uh, I don't care for that one at all. What's that? A 4-09-1885? Meh. Nah, loser. I like the cute little ones. Look at that. So thank you very much, Abdul and Eric from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there's MIT. Um, yes, we do have a university in Australia that's named almost similar, RMIT. That's a Royal Melbourne um, Institute of Technology in, well, you guessed it, it's in the name, Melbourne. Thanks, guys. We've got ourselves a DHL Express from uh, Hong Kong from SIS. SZ, um, Glyn Co Limited. Um, maybe I've like ordered something and I've forgotten about it. Um, because it's actually no one. Oh, okay, right. No, I think I know what it is. Yep, we've had this company on the blog before, so they're having a second suck of the salve. And yep, I think they emailed me that I was getting these. And it'll be for all you aficionados out there. From Lumen Top. Ta da! We have a flashlight for all you flashlight aficionados, or a torch, as we call them here in Australia. Is that upside down? Well, the electrons are going to fall out. And it looks like we have three of them. Let's take a squiz. And we've seen Lumen Top torches before, and they're decent quality. They're sent in this uh, TD16. They didn't include any uh, specs in the box, but we've got a uh, lanyard and something else i don't know what oh yeah uh so rubber spare rubber o-rings and stuff like that so this is a tactical flashlight as they call it and uh it's got uh basically well four different modes might well five or six or something like that but basically up to a thousand lumens uh maximum with a cree xml2 lead none of the um uh, fake rubbish. They'd be uh, genuine Cree leads in these things. Retails for 100 or 99 US bucks. So it's a serious flashlight. Feels great quality. The anodizing on it, absolutely brilliant. Built like a brick dunny. They claim up to 310 meters uh, throw on this thing. I don't know. I can't test that here in the lab. And up to a thousand lumens maximum. Uh, 2.2 hours and uh but of course that's like that's insano mode um it's also got 35 lumens for 40 hours uh which is a decent uh run time for 35 lumens or 220 lumens which is much more practical for everyday use uh 8.7 hours o-ring seal of course you wouldn't have to worry about dropping that in the water and a rechargeable um 18650 cell as well this one's got the uh, built-in protection circuit that'd be the in the end there yeah, to be in the top side, there, maybe there it is, under there, you can see where they've, yep, yeah, got the battery and the protection circuits in there. Highly recommend uh, the protection circuit in the battery. So let's switch that on. By default, it goes to the last mode you left it at, which is very nice. That was 35, this is 220 lumens, and that's a full 1000 lumens here, you can't get a decent uh, view of that on the camera, but uh, you'll notice that if I switch it off and then back on, it'll go back to the 1000. So. That is super intelligent. I like that. 
And you might think that's a metal ring around there. That's actually rubber on there. So it's designed to see how it bounces. It's designed to sort of take an impact like that. So that's pretty jazzy. I like that. Nice design. And if we switch this baby on, that's the 35 lumens, 220 and a thousand. Nice wide beam. It look, might look a bit worse on camera, but that lights up pretty well. I've got uh, constant exposure on the camera there, but that works really nicely. And just a trigger warning. No, not one of these newfangled uh, emotional trigger warnings. This is, you know, neurological or medical or whatever. If you don't like strobe lights, then yeah, um, pause and fast forward now because it's got a strobe mode. Here we go. And it's also got a slower uh, strobe mode as well. And then we've got this cute little puppy, the Lumen Top Worm. Um, it's only 13 bucks, super cheap. It's got the Cree uh, XPG2 for those playing along at home, 110 lumens maximum. And this looks like a nice bit of kit. I'm very, very happy with my, uh, this is my everyday carry, which I have on my uh, key ring everywhere I go and I use it all the time uh, that's a multi-mode I can't remember the exact model of that but that's a lumen top as well and that has been awesome and this thing is kind of cute actually smaller neat although the problem with this one is that it doesn't have the uh, switch in the end I much prefer the two-way action of this one I so I can twist it off and also use the switch so there's no way this can accidentally go off in my uh, pocket um, so I much prefer that even though it is a little bit longer than this worm but for 13 bucks meh, can't get wrong and they sent me a special worm brass one just like my other one I think Ooh, this is special I'm not sure if you can buy this I think it's for uh, uh, yeah oh look at that look at that fancy pantsy thank you very much exactly the same but made out of brass oh sweet ass Another one from the United States of America, this time from Ann Arbor in Michigan, from Dan uh, Romanchik. G'day, Dan. And uh, he's can probably tell from the form factor what it might be. Anyway, we'll find out. Let, oh, this one's getting, yeah, uh, this is going to be nasty with the big knife. So I'll do this. Let's have a look. Dan is a, he's a ham. Not only is Dan a ham, but he's written some study guides for uh, hair radio operators to get your license. Brilliant, let's have a quick squeeze. Check these out, these look jazzy. No nonsense, no BS, thank you very much. Uh, different study guides for, I didn't know there were two different classes of ham radio, the general class and the technician class. I take it the technician class is uh, better, but why is it thinner? Uh, any, <laughs> I don't know. No, I think technician, I might have that back to front. I think the general allows you to do more. I'm going to stand corrected on that. I have to Google it when I do the edit for this thing. Anyway, Dan has written these two guides, which are free as a PDF on his website, which is absolutely awesome. Or you can buy the uh, print edition or the ebook uh, version, and I'll link them in down below. So if you are going for your um, ham radio or you want to go for your ham radio exam, then let's, uh, these are, go up to 2019. Fantastic. I guess they change the rules every few, they reevaluate the rules in 2019, do they? Electrical principles, circuit components, practicals, signals and emissions, antennas, feed lines, radio wave propagation. Oh, it's all in there. Safety. And apparently it's a 35 question multiple choice exam, uh, both the technician and the general. You must score at least 75 so you've got to answer 26 out of 35 of them correctly. And I'm sure if you follow Dan's guides, you'll no doubt uh, get these things. Re electrical principles, there's your reactants and everything else. Fantastic. Transformers, you've got Ohm's Law, all sorts of stuff. Ah, oh, general electronic stuff, as almost everyone would uh, know about that sort of stuff. Power supply, schematic symbols. Oh, there you go. And then you've got to do some FET stuff. There you go. So if you want to brush up on your FET, oh, you've got to do some digital stuff. Oh, there you go. Amplifiers and oscillators and all sorts of stuff. There you go. Basic antenna theory and things like that. Oh, isotropic antennas and all oh, dipoles and that sort of stuff. So cool. And one for the technician class as well. Anyway, I won't go through them. Uh, check out his website. You can download the PDF yourself and by all means, uh, buy it to support Dan. Fantastic. Good on you, Dan. 
And I do get this question quite constantly. Uh, am, well, do I have my ham radio license? The answer is no. Am I going to get one? The answer is probably no, because I don't lie necessarily like the idea of getting it just for like to say I've got it, you know, just like a trophy uh, thing, you know, and I just don't have the time or inclination to use it probably, but I don't know if anyone can convince me otherwise, I'll, yeah, maybe I should do it, get my license. Maybe, uh, can you choose your own call sign? VK2EEV, perhaps? Hmm. Another one from Germany. Well, US and Germany are my two most uh, popular uh, countries where I'm viewed. Anyway, about roughly 25% tops or something from the US. Germany's about 12, 14%, something like that. And then the UK, then Australia, I think, or is Canada right up there? Canada, UK, Australia, about very similar. Anyway, um, thank you very much, uh, Frederick Meslin from Bonn in Germany. Haven't been to Bonn. Let's have a squiz. Uh oh, I think I just chopped the, <laughs> I just chopped the note. Sorry. All right, let's have a look. Ooh. We have ourselves a shield. Let's check it out. And Frederick here uh, launched his first Kickstarter, uh, which was successful because it was talked about on the EV blog forum and everything else. And he used my video um, that I did about uh, uh, how to, you know, uh, price your hardware products and things like that. And um, he did that and followed, and it's been quite successful. Anyway, this is a uh, DS Pick um, mi microchip DS Pick Arduino Shield. And it's a tiny music synthesizer. There you go. So, you know, you don't need much more than the DS Pick. You just need output driver, and that's about it. Because DSP uh, Pick is a, well, yeah, 60 bit uh, processor, 32K RAM, 256K of flash, all the other jazz. No floating point support. Don't necessarily need it. And, um, but perfect for generating, uh, you know, stereo FM signals and things like that. Anyway, he's managed to pack in an FM synthesizer engine with uh, 10 voices, four operator algorithms, sample and playback with eight voices, 32 drum and percussion samples. Fantastic. And it outputs in 16-bit stereo. Absolutely terrific. Um, so if you are in the market for a uh, music synthesizer to output any form of uh, music from an Arduino, check it out. I'll link it in down below. Looks jazzy. And a third suck of the sav from Germany, did you believe it? Uh, Tobias uh, Muller, or Mueller. Um, has Tobias been on here before? Is he having a second suck of the sav as well? Ooh, got some nice flowers. The flower stamps there too. Anyway, uh, Tuben, Tubengen. <laughs> you know I can't pronounce anything. Anyway, let's whip it open. Let's see what Tobias has sent. Letter. Whoa, lots of stickers. Warning. This device may contain internet. Okay. Uh oh. Hang on. Oh. Should I be concerned? Should I be concerned? NSA. I sure I I am on some sort of US watch list anyway. Oh. Oh, we got lots of goodness in here. Handle with care. This way down. Oh. This way up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Looks dangerous. Let's go. All right, we've got some interesting stuff in here. I think this is going to be really fascinating. You'll like these. And uh, yeah, NSA, monitored device. Uh-oh, where's the tracker? Is it one of these? One of these? Bloody MS NSA. You've got to watch what you... Anyway, oh, that looks like a... That's like... Plugs in your multimeter. No, no, it plugs into your power supply. Okay, I thought that plugged, in, it plugged into your multimeter. It doesn't. Plugs into your power supply. Hey, isn't that jazzy? There you go, it's a USB charging adapter for bench power supplies for easy monitoring and limiting of the USB current. So you just uh, plug that in. Anyway, it's all GitHubable down here. I'll link it in if you want. And you can, of course, use the current meter on your power supply to measure the charging current. And the switches here, of course, switch in a resistor. Out of, well, they generate like a voltage on the lines and things. And that's how Apple and others uh, determine what... Uh, charging mode to actually use. So that's neat. I like it. Anyway, GitHub down below. And check out what we have here. Yay! Look at this. It's one of these flippy dot displays. These really, aren't they super bright? Sort of, uh, that might look green on the camera. It's kind of more yellow. I do have my white balance set. Maybe it's just the LCD. Haven't color braided it. Anyway, flippy dots. Um, 
flippy dot display. Let me show you the bottom of it. Anyway, you've probably seen these. They flip from black to whatever colors on the front. Usually it's green or yellow, but you can get others. Um, and you'll see these in, you know, like uh, terminal displays in airports and things like that. They're a dot matrix, although these will come in uh, lines, I believe. Will they? Yep. So there's the individual flippy dot module, obviously uh, desoldered there, but so second hand, but of course there's not much that can go wrong with them. They've just got a coil on there and it just, you can just flip them over like that. And they're of course super high visibility. You can't get much better. And uh, they're just, you know, great. And they don't require any power to stay in position. You just, you know, only require power when you flip them over. Oh, isn't that cute? Look at that. I apply um, 12 volts AC to it, and well, square wave at uh, one, well, at two hertz, and there you go, flip, 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 and you'll notice that the ones next to it are actually affected. Looks like we have some coupling between that first one and the next one. <laughs> now, of course, the interesting thing about these is that you only need to pulse them. I'll show you the data sheet in a sec, and you'll notice that if I try and flip that over, it will actually flip back. Okay, that's because it's magnetized one coil there and it will always flip back to what it was actually programmed to do. Now, if I apply, oh, I think I got it around the right way. I've set my function gen to give a uh, one, uh, one millisecond pulse because that's the spec on this thing. And we'll see it flipped over. Okay, it's given a single uh, one millisecond pulse every 500 milliseconds, okay? So it only goes in the one direction because it's not going negative. Now we've flipped it over like that. You notice I haven't changed it, but now it flips back to the negative. Oh, it should. <laughs> yeah, it flips back to the, the negative part. And if we, I think we had it around the other way before, didn't we? So if we, sorry, I should have been set up triggering there we go and it flips back and there's nothing really advanced in there at all as you know they're electromechanical beasts and there's a couple of coils in there and that's all she wrote and these things are really really versatile as you can see really high contrast and you go between the black and the yellow green or whatever color you choose and they've got incredible contrast on them so they're great for those terminal displays and you'll see them flip because they're often they're multiplexed of course you know like the well the drive system will be multiplexed so you'll see them like flicking rows or something like that as the multiplexer goes along and updates the display you've no doubt seen those in uh, airport or bus terminals or something like that and this is an Alpha Zeta brand for those playing along at home. They go, oh, yeah, I know Alpha Zeta. I, yeah, use them all the time. No worries. Um, these are, they use flip disk technology. No trademark on that. These ones are available in two different sizes. Light reflective uh, dot materials are available in red and fluorescent color materials, including yellow. So I think that's what we've got here. Um, and but you can get the reverse side being any other color as well. Uh, up to 100 million operations these puppies are rated for. So very very impressive. And there you go. It specifically tells you down there for variable message signs the magnetic memory retains the indicator status through shock vibration or power failure. So that's a beautiful thing about them. You know, you're in your airport terminal or whatever and the power fails. Well, the sign is still going to the last sign that they set is still going to be up there. And it looks like we can go up to 24 volts for 500 microseconds here for the pulse width. So presumably this would be like the minimum pulse width required to magnetically set the uh, the magnetic memory on the thing and flip the uh, dot. The interesting thing though is that uh, well the maximum pulse rate at 20 degrees C they specified at a temperature so at ambient temperature nominal um, 368 pulses per second very impressive and the maximum pulse rate at a <laughs> higher 70 degrees C is 102 pulses per second. Amazing I don't know why you'd want to pulse them that fast um, like, unless you're doing animation on the things or something. Anyway, dot mechanical turning time takes uh, 70 milliseconds maximum, uh, average of 50 milliseconds to flip your little dot over. And there you go. So these things are neat. I love them. Flippy dot displays, as I call them, like flip dot. I call them flippy dot displays because it sounds cuter. Anyway, these things are fantastic. So it would be nice to like wire up something and be able to, you know, like, well, we've got what, an eight by two, four, oh, Two, four, six, seven. That's enough for a character anyway. So, yeah. Anyway, you can't do a huge amount unless you had like a big, huge one or something like that. And so these are obviously uh, surplus. But uh, 
nothing wrong with them. <laughs> so you can reuse these, no worries whatsoever. And as you can see, they do, like, it is hard to sort of flip those. So they are right about the vibration and, you know, stuff like that. Hold, ma like, actually retaining the magnetic memory in the thing. You know, I've got to manually sort of get in there and actually flip the dot over. So, yeah, they actually retain their last image uh, pretty well. Yeah, look at that. Beauty. So thank you very much, Tobias, for an interesting look at the flippy dot displays. That's awesome. I've got to have one from the old dart just to even out the countries. Uh, this one is from Mr. T. Cope. Excellent. From uh, Sunderland in the old dart. So let's please open it carefully. Yep. There we go. I carefully opened it at the top. Ooh. Oh, old school. Sorry, it's the spoiler. Yep, old school smell. We have an old school Yamaha. What on earth is that from? I don't know. Some Yamaha bit of audio kit? Now, Tez has sent in this board, which he wants me to fix, so I'm not sure what uh, video blog he's watching, but yeah, I don't really do repairs here on the, well, not repairs that people send in anyway. Um, it's, the people always think it's a quick fix. Um, let's have a look at the board here. Now, it's, it's a Yamaha from a Yamaha Thing keyboard, PSR275 keyboard, and well, there's a few issues with this right off the bat. Um, it did send in the uh, overlay for it, but uh, no schematic. So we've got the uh, component overlay, and you can see that there's a DC jack missing here. Presumably this like goes right out the back of the unit, and this is where the user plugs in their, um, you know, uh, decent, their, uh, plugs in their plug pack to power the thing, and the board is like it's cut right off and it looks like it's burnt as well something has gone horribly wrong there and not only that but look at this there's a what looks like a weird four pin connector there uh well uh, two pins plus i don't know is that two mounting pins i don't know but that's had the crap burnt out of it pads absolutely lifted off there Look at that, that has been absolutely butchered and that is marked as the uh, left speaker and then the right speaker as well has been totally butchered. All the pads left off. So, geez, you know, like, yeah, you could if you were desperate uh, repair this. You know, you can put the connector back in and epoxy it, uh, maybe bodge in a board or something like that, but... Gee, you know, I well, if I was desperate enough to get something like this back up and running, I'd do it. But uh, no, um, sorry, Tez, I'm not going to attempt to uh, repair such a thing and send it back. It's not what I do here on the EV blog. Anyway, there you go, single-sided board, classic construction. Heatsink's obviously missing. We've still got the heatsink compound on the back there. And um, what on earth is, you know happened to, and the ribbon cable's been uh, desoldered as well from the other end, and it's all a bit, how you doing? Um, I, yeah, hmm. And Tez also asks if I can uh, power it up and test it to see if it's worthy of being repaired. Well, no, not really. I've got no information at all about this. Um, so, no, I can't just power it up and <laughs> test it, I'm afraid. So sorry, just for uh, future reference of those who want to send something in to be repaired, it's not what I do here on the mailbag. Um, and any repairs I do are things I'm personally interested in for some reason. So, um, yeah, please don't send things in for repair. Thanks. We don't get too many from Greece. I know all my Greek viewers are. This is Soteris Zorbus. Am I pronouncing that? Guaranteed incorrectly. Anyway, thank you very much. Let's see what's in. Yeah, it probably had one of those quick opening things. Does it matter? Let's see. We have a note. And we have a doodad. Don't like reading the notes. A bit of a spoiler for myself. 
it looks like a display module Sigma Zeta electronics one of those um is that a is that a two digit sorry a two line display module SOTOS is apparently how you uh, pronounce it and uh, 23 years old has been going since it was 12 absolute beauty and um, this is his first open source hardware project it's a programmable panel meter of sorts awesome let's check it out so SOTOS is sending this uh, little panel meter you can't actually see anything in there at the moment but uh, this is uh, presumably an open source hardware is it doesn't say but uh, it's available from his uh, tindy store down here and um, it's pretty specky it's uh, adjusted um, each one's individually calibrated for around about 0.05% uh, uh, gain error. Not too shabby at all. It's built in 12-bit uh, ADC and everything else. And there's a current shunt resistor in there um, with 100 millivolts. So maximum input voltage range of uh, 5 volts. Typically these are, doesn't say the maximum number of counts really, but these things are typically, uh, you know, 200 millivolts uh, full scale input or something like that. So this is 5 volts uh, full scale input which is kind of handy, so you get, you know, so you're not down in the noise, you know, if you've got a, a 10 volt power supply or something, you would just drop that in half to give you your maximum uh, 5 volt input range, so let's crack it open. So there you go, that's actually a two digit display, couldn't see <laughs> behind there, so voltage and current at the same time, presumably very jazzy, and uh, that's all she wrote in the back. There's a micro external ADC. It's the MC3112 for those playing along at home. And uh, and a high side current sensor in the Max uh, 44284. And a current shunt resistor. And I don't I think there's only one current shunt resistor. And Bob's your uncle. So that's neat. Um, did you um, SOTOS? Let us know. Did you get this uh, case uh, custom made and you just fitted the board? To fit, is it like another, is it a different uh, case or anything like that? Or uh, did you get it uh, custom made? Let us know. Now the interesting thing is that there's a uh, I squared C interface as well. So you can transfer uh, data and get measurements and things like that. So it's kind of like a, uh, a all-in-one solution for your uh, panel mount microcontroller projects and stuff like that. Pretty good for a do-it-yourself power supply. Should work a treat. Next up, one from Sweden by the looks of it, and uh, security alert, security alert, look at that, um, yeah, security checked, jeez, I was serious about this, I didn't want this to get out of the country, um, from SensePeak, uh, I think it's from John Hellman, I'm not sure if uh, John's the person who just is the packing, shipping person or whatever, or the viewer that sent it in, we won't know until we open it up, so... Let's do that. Yeah, DHL. Jeez, they were, they were serious. Now, checking this. Obviously looked completely sus. Oh, what on earth are these things? Hey, Dave, your blog is wonderful. We just love it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh. 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 It's available on Indiegogo. It's very mirror-like finish. It's a PCB... It's called the PCB Byte or PC Byte. Yes, apparently. Uh, uh sorry, Johan. Uh, Johan. Uh, Hellman, Magnus, Sh Soberg, and Magnus Birch. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, they're from Sweden. And this looks really interesting. It's a PCB holder, but it's springy. I like. I I was baffled at first at how it worked, but it sticks on there, and you've got four of these holders. And you mount your PC, and you can put them anywhere on there. They've got neodymium magnets on them, and you slide that down, and it holds your board in place. Neat. And here it is. It's called the PCB Ite. Um, it the mirror finish really disturbs me. I like that is not the best thing. Anyway, it's a metal surface, and it's just got some uh, feet on the back. Anyway, what is that? Some sort of. Uh, I don't know, stainless steel or something, I'm not entirely sure. But these little magnetic with things with neodymium magnets and look at this. And these just go down like that and and sort of like clamp your board and of course you can move them around anywhere and Bob's your uncle. It's beautiful. Check it out, I can just use two to hold my board there like that. Fantastic. And it just 
sort of, and you can move it around like that, of course, and it's very handy. Even with just two supports in the middle of the board, my board just happens to have uh, slot cutouts in there that fit this very nicely, but you don't need those, of course. But um, if you do have something like that, I mean, I'm putting a lot of force onto that. Wow, I could easily put my iron down there and put a lot of force, and that puppy is going nowhere. But of course, that's just because it's not going to, it's because it's in the slot like that. If I actually put it out like this, that's a, oh no, it's a similar story. But actually, even with two clamped at the back like that, I can still go like that and maybe push stuff in. So, you know, of course you add a, Add a third one here and this puppy's going nowhere. So that's really quite easy. That's probably the easiest to use board holder I've ever had. That's just great. And there's a bit of giving it too, which I don't actually mind. So anyway, this is an Indiegogo. It has finished, but it raised 370% uh, over or something. So they made it and it's 49 bucks, a bit pricey, but these are, these do look really super duper high quality and a diamond cut grip. Look at that, otherwise known as knurling. And uh, spring loader, strong neodymium magnet and a lifetime warranty. Beautiful, but these are really quite well engineered. They're super high quality and I love that spring ain't going to wear out anytime soon I don't think. So that's a winner. If you want those, check them out. Link down below. Hi, this one comes from somebody in the forum who asked about my micro calc project and I've touched on this before in one of the live shows. I think I explained a little bit about it but I thought it probably deserves its own little short blog describing the what the microcalc is, the project, and uh, some of the design aspects that went into it, because it's rather interesting. So let's go. What it is, is it's basically the world's first and only credit card size programmable scientific calculator.